Good morning and welcome to Sunday Online. It's great that you have the opportunity to join us and we trust that as we go through this service, we'll all hear from God. Well, this week for most of us has been a combination of sun and cold and it's what I call window weather where it's better to look out into the weather than it is to be in it. But as we come to worship this morning, I just want to read a couple of verses to you from Ephesians which remind us of some really basic principles of our faith. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourself, but a gift of God. Not by works, so no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And as his church here on earth and in Frinton, that's what we are. We have an opportunity to serve God in our communities. And we're going to sing a song together now. This is Amazing Grace.
So this week is the start of another prayer week, which is a great opportunity for us to be able to come together in smaller groups and to pray to our God. So as you can see on the screen, there is a link here to be able to join us via Zoom and uh, follow the password. Any time you can join this week would be great to see you. Opportunities to pray for our nation, for our church members, for the persecuted church, for youth, for frontline workers, for our local area. A great time to come together and pray. God wants to hear from us, whether it be on our own, with small groups all come together as a church family so we really hope to see you there at some point this week. Thank you Sarah it is so important that as a church we do pray together and as a church we're so fortunate to have links throughout the world and you may remember that uh, over the Easter weekend we launched an appeal uh, to enable the Chandiwanda Foundation to rebuild the toilet block in Zimbabwe which had been destroyed by flooding. of Masasa Primary School, deeply located in the heart of Chikomba District. On the 12th of January 2021, disaster struck the school, which has left a trail of destruction at the school. Masasa Primary School is a school which comprises of an encouragement area of peace and farmers, which deeply depend on donor food handouts in most times. The destruction has left the school with two blocks of 10 square to wall toilets, each grounded, which has severely crippled the smooth running of the school. As it can be seen behind the camera, is one of the blocks which was severely destroyed by the heavy downpour which we continually experience throughout the country. This has left the school with no option but with a sharing ratio, doubled sharing ratio of one square to all to 50 learners. The school is appealing for well wishes, donations and those who can afford to assist the school in the reconstruction of the 20 square to walls which has been destroyed, destroyed before the schools open. And we're able to tell you that through the generosity of our membership, we've been able to raise the sum of £5,000, which is just amazing. And we'd love to thank you for your generosity and for enabling us as a fellowship to bring blessing to those who are in need. And to let you know that the uh, fund will remain open until this coming Friday. And if you'd like to contribute, you'd be very welcome. But please do so before then, because the funds are needed in Zimbabwe to get these toilet blocks rebuilt. You may remember that in the days running up to Easter, the local churches all got together to bring blessing to the local care homes. And there are 21 of them and 550 residents and 450 staff. And each one received a handwritten card by various church members, which brought them a, an Easter uh, blessing. And we sent resource packs to managers 
and uh, a number of hampers went out to the staff. As you can see by these images, uh, they were very well received and brought a huge amount of blessing to the homes involved. So thank you very much for your generosity. And if you were ever out and about on Easter Saturday, you might have noticed something huge, white and fluffy <laughs> uh, taking over the street of Connor Avenue. Snow? Uh, well, quite possibly, it, <laughs> it could have been snow. But actually, it was fantastic work done by Claire and Sam as they brought our Easter, um, Easter hunt for our children in our local area. I think it was very well received. I could see lots and lots of smiles, including my dad, as he saw the bunny rabbit um, trying to hide his way up and down Connor Avenue but it really is great and as you can see by these um, photos here that they had such good fun we really hope you know the church has come to life in the um, Frinton area as we celebrate this Easter time. Good morning a while ago when we were living in London I was doing a delivery to a church and on the church wall was a man sat with a can of cider and I intended to walk past him, but I got this nudge um, that said, go and sit with him. So I sat with him and then I just felt to say, don't say anything. So I didn't say anything. So after about five minutes, I felt the Lord saying, now I want you to say this. So I said to the, to the man, life's really tough, isn't it? He said, yeah. He said, and I just, I said, I just have a sense that this has happened in your life and that's happened in your life and that's happened. And he said, mate, you, you seem to know all about my life. He said, how do you know that? And I said, well, I don't. I said, but Jesus does. And he cares about you. I said, do you know uh, who Jesus is? He said, I know he is, but he wouldn't want to know me. He says, I've been a scally all my life, really. And I said, you're exactly the person that he would love to be involved with. So we spoke a bit more and I prayed with him. And I, I said, you can ask Jesus into your life if you want to. And he said, well, how do I do that? So I said, well, there's a prayer that we can pray that you uh, ask for forgiveness. And then you say, thank you that uh, you died on the cross for me. And please come and live in me by your Holy Spirit uh, to guide me and to encourage me. So he said, yeah, mate, I'm, I'm up for that. So we sat there and we prayed and um, and he, uh, he hugged me. It was before lockdown and uh, we went on our way. Following day, I got uh, I got into the office and my general manager said, did you uh, pray with a bloke yesterday? I said, yeah, I did his hands. He said, that, well, he's just phoned up uh, this morning to say, like, it's made such a difference in his life. And um, praise the Lord. Thanks. Bye bye. Let's pray. Dad, thank you so much for all that you do for us in the day to day. I'm sure many things come to mind for people, things that you've done this week or this month. Uh, we thank you for those things, Dad. For me personally, it's the restoration of work that I'm seeing. So thank you for those things. And thank you as well, Dad, that we are seeing an easing off of lockdown. Uh, although there are still many rules remain, Thank you that we are able to start meeting again with people from other households, people that perhaps we haven't seen face to face for quite some time. I pray as well, Dad, for those of us who are maybe facing a bit of lack of motivation um, as lockdowns begin to ease. Perhaps we haven't had as much work as we do or work has been easier or perhaps we haven't had any work recently. Um, thanks for the lockdowns and I just pray that as things get back to normal you would help us to get back into the swing of things uh, as things begin to open up again in our community and make, and eventually within our church uh, I pray that you would motivate us to get back involved in those things or perhaps if we weren't involved in things before perhaps we will find the motivation to get involved um, with new things As well, Dad, we pray for those who have perhaps lost some contact with our church while we've been in lockdown, that when we are able to return um, to meeting as a congregation again, um, 
and to return to doing many of the activities that perhaps we haven't been able to do um, thanks to these lockdowns. I pray that we would see those people returning and, uh, and that we would perhaps see a continuation as well of that vision that we had for our church uh, of a growing crowd excited by you and becoming disciples. And lastly, Dad, I think as well of the persecuted Christians all over the world, particularly um, at the moment, those in North Korea, Afghanistan and Somalia, three of the worst offending nations where Christians are very likely to be killed for their beliefs. Uh, Dad, I pray for those facing that persecution, for safety for them. Um, but also for courage and bravery um, if it is your desire for them to step out uh, and profess their faith. I think back to, um, in your Bible, with Paul, uh, the story of Paul and all the persecution that he faced for his faith. Persecution that he even put on others before he became a Christian. And as well the persecution that many of your disciples and many of your followers at that time faced both in Jerusalem and from the Roman Empire but that as we know over time through their courage of them professing their faith and even through their martyrdom eventually that Rome became Christian and I pray that we might see the same for these countries that through the courage of these people to profess their faith in you in such dire circumstances and when the cost of doing so can be so great. I pray for their sake, for the sake of their sacrifice, that those countries would become not just accepting of Christians, but that they might one day become Christian nations. Amen.
As we come this morning, we're going to take the opportunity to listen to a message by Dan Gower from Open Doors, who's going to share with us the experiences of Christians throughout the world who live in an environment that is somewhat different to ours. What if your church had to meet in secret? What if spies watched your every move? What if following Jesus meant you faced violence or even death? Millions of Christians around the world experience these kinds of challenges every day. And these are the top 10 countries where faith costs the most. Number 10, India. Hindu extremists want to rid India of Christians and they are prepared to use extreme violence to achieve their goal. At number nine, Nigeria where more Christians are murdered for their faith than in any other country in the world. Iran is at number eight. Secret house churches risk being raided by the police. If caught, be prepared for a long prison sentence. Number seven, Yemen, a war-torn country where Christians, if discovered, face the death penalty. Eritrea is at number six. If your faith is discovered, you can be imprisoned without trial in appalling conditions. Often, your loved ones don't even know if you're still alive. Number five, Pakistan. Say the wrong thing in Pakistan and the notorious blasphemy laws could see you accused of insulting Islam and sentenced to death. At number four is Libya, a lawless land with no freedom of speech or belief. Somalia is number three on the list. Somali Christians can't reveal their faith to anyone or they could be killed, even by their own families. Number two is Afghanistan. If they find out you're a Christian, you have a stark choice. Flee the country or be killed. And at number one, North Korea, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Informants are everywhere. Discovery means death, either by execution or by being worked to death in a labour camp. At least 340 million Christians around the world experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. What if you could help them? For 65 years, Open Doors has stood alongside the persecuted church, strengthening Christians who dare to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. Your prayers and gifts enable our underground networks to reach millions of Christians with emergency food and aid, spiritual care, smuggled Bibles and Christian books, training and legal advice. But more than that, your support means that persecuted Christians know that they are not forgotten, not alone. After all, these are not strangers and they are not statistics. They are our brothers and sisters and they need our help. Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Dan. I'm part of the team at Open Doors. Thank you for having me and thank you so much for your prayer and support for the Persecuted Church. It's amazing and such an encouragement and blessing to our family around the world. Um, I'm married to Grace, got three kids, and we live in Derbyshire, which is great. My hair doesn't normally look like this, it's thanks to lockdown, so looking forward to that easing in some way and getting out and about a little bit. Um, I've worked for Open Doors for a couple of years, a charity founded by Brother Andrew. You may have read his story in God Smuggler, and that's where it all began. We support persecuted Christians around the world who share our faith, but not our freedom. A persecuted Christian is someone who, because of their faith in Jesus, is pursued. That's what the word means. It can mean they lose their job and income. They could be isolated, forced out of their families. Their buildings and churches could be targeted and set on fire. And in the most extreme cases, it can mean imprisonment, abduction, or even death, just for following after Jesus. Let me share with you a story. Rebecca, Etni, and Ratna are three women from Indonesia, and they led a church of about 30 people. 
and Rebecca would take the lead on that and she was a GP as her day job. And as Rebecca would walk to the church each week, she started to notice loads of kids just knocking about on the street. No one kind of caring for them or looking after them. And so she started a club. She got permission. She started a club on a Sunday, like a Sunday school, feeding them, providing fun and games and food, but also sharing about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. And uh, she ran this club with her two friends, Etni and Ratna. And it was a beautiful thing until actually the impact started to be noticed by people and local Muslim fundamentalists got these three ladies arrested. A show trial took place, about 500 people just screaming and hurling abuse and hatred at these three women. And as a result, they were imprisoned for five years for telling children about Jesus. They were placed in a wing called Block Juanita with terrorists and drug smugglers. And one of the inmates had a policy that if you gave her $10, she would kill anybody for you. All of this for following Jesus. And this is the challenge that many Christians face all over the world. We work in over 60 countries supporting, caring, providing and equipping Christians to follow Jesus. The Open Doors World Watch List is something we produce each year and it ranks the 50 most dangerous places on earth to follow Jesus. It shows the global state of play, if you like. And for the 20th consecutive year, North Korea is top of the list. If you go to our website, which is www.opendoorsuk.org, there you'll find articles, prayer points and greater details on all of the top 50 countries and many others. And they represent over 340 million Christians. And that's just short of the population of the United States of America. 340 million stories, 340 million Christian brothers and sisters. And in the last year, persecution has intensified and increased. The fires of persecution are burning faster and further than ever before. And you can see this demonstrated with the two pictures I'm putting on screen now, one from 2016 and one from 2021. And the red and orange colours you can see on these maps are for extreme and high levels of persecution. And you can see how it has intensified even over the last five years. We have a chalkboard in our kitchen that we write all sorts of things on, from reminders through to inspirational quotes. And in this moment, actually for some time, we've had the words of C.S. Lewis on this board. They read, life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace within difficulties. We can know the peace that passes all understanding in our hearts and in our minds. And I want to today reflect upon some words from 2 Corinthians 4, the lessons that we learn from it and how we can take heart that no matter what we face, we can take heart. So I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and I'm going to start in verse 7. Paul says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. Paul is writing to tell this church that despite their suffering, despite their brokenness and failures, that God is in the business of redemption, that God will build, that God will reconcile, that God will encourage. And Paul time and again talks about us having strength in weakness. It's a real countercultural teaching that, isn't it? That actually in our weakness, we discover strength. We appreciate our powerlessness in those moments, but in our powerlessness, we see the power of God. Verse 7, Paul says we have this treasure in jars of clay. In the ancient world, it was a common metaphor for human weakness. And we're told that this treasure that we have, Jesus, is shown in just jars of clay. In us, in weakness, in brokenness. 
This last year has certainly floored us at times. We've all experienced a measure of hardship, of isolation, dealing with restrictions and all the emotion that's gone on with that, with pain and loss and grief. And yet it's in our weakness that we can display the triumph of God. If you feel broken by this last year, know this, God can and does do amazing things. I see it all the time in our persecuted church family. Now, if I was in prison for following Jesus, I'd probably be a wreck, <laughs> screaming for help, feeling utterly hopeless, feeling alone, feeling weak. Where would I see God's strength? How could I bring hope? Let me go back to that story I opened with earlier from Indonesia. Rebecca, Etni and Ratna, they faced a choice behind these bars. What would they do? They told children about Jesus, but what would they do now? In the face of trial, when they feel beaten up, when they feel alone, they chose to bring light into the darkest of places. Block Juanita was this sinister prison block. It had excrement and urine all over the walls of the prison and utterly hopeless place yet in the first 24 hours of being in this place something remarkable happened Rebecca heard the voice of God this whisper of God the Holy Spirit and responding to what she heard she asked for buckets of water for disinfectant and the three ladies began to scrub down the place they began to take their rations and gave them away they began to cook for others in the prison so that inmates could eat properly and gradually, little by little by little, the environment began to change as these ladies continually were thanking God and serving him in the darkest of places. In just the third week of their imprisonment, one of the prison guards came to Rebecca, the doctor, telling her that he had severe stomach cramps and said, will you help me? Now, a question for you, would you help someone who is unjustly keeping you locked in your cell for at least 15 hours every single day? What well, Rebecca did. She gave him advice and at the end of the month, 40 guards were receiving medical advice from Dr. Rebecca. It's quite remarkable. It's treasure in jars of clay so that when the trouble comes, which it does, and we may feel heavy hearted and we might feel in the midst of it right now, but we have to throw ourselves back on the mercy of God. And in doing so, we appreciate the life giving power of God when we realize our powerlessness. He can use us in all and every situation if we would just surrender our will to his. These great verses again, verse eight, we are afflicted in every way but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Many of us, I'm sure, will identify with some, if not all, of these feelings at different points in our life. Yet it's the fourfold, but not here, that encourages us. The story is not over. Struck down, but not destroyed. We bring our challenge, our affliction, our confusion to him. The imagery kind of stirs up this imagery of a boxing match. You know, we might have been knocked to the canvas, but the bell's not been rung. Let me tell you about Chinese evangelist Wang Mingdao. In 1955, Wang Mingdao is imprisoned by the Chinese government for resisting the government. Now, what that means was Wang Mingdao was saying, no, Jesus is Lord, nobody else. And because of that, he was imprisoned. He was told that he could go free if he would sign a confession of his crimes. He had to state that he would no longer be a Christian. He would stop sharing about Jesus. And so Wang Mingdao initially signed that document and he was released. But within a few days, he realised he'd made a terrible mistake. He went back to the authorities. He recanted his confession. And as a result... He was sentenced to 22 years in prison, many of those years in solitary confinement. An evangelist, if you've ever met an evangelist, <laughs> locked up by themselves, a worst case scenario for an evangelist, no one to speak to. What would you do? Down, but not out. Ever the evangelist, Wang Mingdao, realised he could actually preach 
down the pit toilet in the corner of his cell. As all the sewage pipes were linked together and so the sound would carry to other prisoners. And so he decided to make this toilet his preaching platform. And over, his, over many years, during the time of his imprisonment, he saw 96 people come to faith because he taught them about Jesus by preaching down the pit toilet. This is what the man had to say. I had no Bible, no pulpit, no audience, no pen, no paper. I could do nothing, nothing except get to know God. And for 20 years, that was the greatest relationship that I have ever known. When I was in the cell, the only thing I was focused on was getting to know Jesus. It was only me and him in that cell. And so you need to build yourself a cell where it's only you and Jesus. He maximised what he had. He gave it all for Jesus. After all, Jesus had given it all for him. And that line challenges me. You need to build yourself a cell where it's only you and Jesus. Think about your own life before God. We were far from him. You might feel far from him right now. Yet in God's grace and his mercy, he's made a way for us in the person of Jesus Christ. It's what we celebrate at Easter. In fact, we celebrate all the time. That while we were still sinners, while we were far off, Christ died for us. God's love for us is that strong that he dies in our place. Remarkable. So when we are down, we're still loved. When we're broken, we're still loved. So don't give up. Keep going. Keep trusting. Keep looking up. Paul continues on in this passage and he, he calls us to hope. And hope is not this faint, wishful thinking. Often is in the world, but biblical hope is the confident expectation of God doing what God has promised that he will do. It's based on the strength of God's faithfulness, not of our own. I love that. Hope is based on the strength of his faithfulness, not our own. Therefore, hope is about him. It's not about us. And I believe this passage and the experience of our persecuted church family should drive us to hope. Paul talks about God, the Holy Spirit, being with us, being present, knowing God's got it. He's in control. That the same God who raised Jesus from the dead will raise us to life. Look at what he goes on to say from verse 16. So, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We persevere because we know that even in our brokenness and in our weakness that God is at work. I love that Paul says collectively, we do not lose heart. It's not just his own personal experience, but it's for all of us. We all face things that we'd rather not go through. But even then, don't lose heart. We don't throw in the towel because we have eternity in mind. Paul contrasts here the present age with the future. He says, guys, compared with what is to come, whatever we face is light and momentary. It's not minimising what we're going for. It's just in comparison to. Remember Rebecca, Etney and Ratner in prison for teaching Sunday school kids? Well, after three months of imprisonment, they were called to the superintendent's office where they were told that I was informed that you were subversive and I was going to break you all in prison. But you've been a blessing to the entire prison. They're the words of the superintendent. He goes on to say, how would it be if I invited your church to come into the prison and take services every single Sunday? Remarkable. Now, over the course of their time in prison, Rebecca, Etney and Ratner were a blessing to all those in prison with them. These are Rebecca's words. Every second of every day, I have to trust Jesus with all of my heart and I have to lean on him. I don't understand the circumstances fully, but I trust that he will guide me. I am becoming a master of trusting God. 
and I'm full of joy and peace that God is going to be glorified through my surrendered life. Prison was not the end of their story, nor is COVID or what's to come, the anxiety that surrounds all of that. The call for us is to surrender to Jesus and he will deal with all the detail. As these three women walked free from this prison, other prisoners were crying. They were released on a Friday, but by the Monday they were back in the prison as guests, discipling the 47 people they'd led to faith during their time. They were broken vessels. They had treasure in jars of clay, carrying hope with their eyes up, not on the things that are seen, but on the eternal. So my friends, how do we respond? What can we do? Well, we want our persecuted church family who share our faith but not our freedom to know that they are not alone. That we're family, that we stand with them, that we support them, that we would stand in the gap. And gap stands for giving, action and prayer. We can support, we can act and we can pray. Action can look like all kinds of things, but with Rebecca Etney and Ratner's story, they were released halfway through their sentence so that they were sentenced for five years, but they only served two and a half years because supporters in the UK and Ireland and around the world wrote to the president of Indonesia. We can pray. Time and again, the persecuted church, they, they tell us, they say, we love that you pray with us. We know that you pray. We know God's presence, so please pray. And there is no prison wall that is too thick for prayers to be answered. As Brother Andrew says, and this is especially true right now, with travel restrictions, our prayers go where we cannot. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Thank you so much for your support, for your prayers, for your giving, your action, your prayers for our persecuted family who choose to follow Jesus no matter the cost. God bless.
great to have such a strong message through that song saying, Jesus, I need you. And at such a time like this, Jesus, we need you now more than ever. Mm. And uh, just thinking back to what uh, Steve has said about God giving him a nudge to go and speak to this um, guy on a wall, I think it takes me back to a while ago when we were handing out leaflets to advertise Seventh Hour at Prince's Theatre in Clacton. And myself and two others were handing out leaflets to houses in Clacton. And we got to the end of our leaflet drop, but we still had a bag of leaflets left over. So we sat down in a little garden and we're just thinking, well, what can we do? We don't want to put multiple leaflets through people's doors. What, what's the best thing? When a guy started walking through the garden. And so we said to each other, well, we should Give a, give a leaflet to him. Are you going to do it? No, no, you go. For, you could go for it. No, you, you can. You can go yeah. and do it. Well, as it was, all three of us stood up at the same time and the bag of leaflets split and they all fell all over the floor. And then all three of us decided to pick one up and give it to this gentleman as he walked through the garden. And you just think, that's it. When God wants to give you a nudge, he'll nudge you. He'll make yeah. sure that you are put in the right place and will enable you at the right time to be able to give his message across. If it feels right for you, I just want to finish the service with some of those lyrics in Jesus, I Need You. And if it feels right for you, please just use them as a prayer for yourself. Christ before me, Christ behind me. Your loving kindness has never failed me. Jesus, I need you. Every moment I need you. Christ before me, Christ behind me. May this bless you this week. Amen. Amen.